Well, good evening, and thank you so much for coming to our annual real estate forecast. It's truly fantastic to see you all here tonight in person after a three-year hiatus from this event. As with much of the world, in May, I'm sorry, in March of 2020, we weren't sure what was going to happen. Do we cancel the forecast? Do we forge ahead? With uncertainty, we decided to go ahead and hold the forecast at the community concert hall. For those of you that were there that evening, you might remember we were advised not to shake hands with anyone. Rather, we were doing some elbow bumps, some foot tip, yep, some fist bumps, uh, but no handshaking. It was, it was just the beginning of what became the great migration. It was a sight to remember. It was an era filled with feeding frenzies, extremely low interest rates. Remember those days? Three, four percent interest. Multiple offers and what has now been dubbed as the Great Migration. As we gather here this evening, we will discuss the future of real estate in a post-pandemic world. The second half of the presentation, we will be joined by our esteemed guests, Nicole Killian, Eva Henson, and Lynn Hyde, followed by a Q&A session. Allow me to take a minute to shout out to our sponsors. Without them, this event would not be possible. Alpine Bank, American Ag Credit, Animus Mountain Mortgage, Bank Central, Bank of Colorado, Bank of the San Juans, the Norm Phillips Team, Mountain to Desert Mortgage, Simber Capital Lending, and TBK Bank. Thank you all. Please join me in welcoming John Wells and Bob Allen to the stage. Ready to go? Ready to go, Bob. Thanks to new owners, Zane, Abby, and Thad, and of course, John. Let's have a big round of applause for the Wells Group for doing this for 24 years. So I'm gonna get right into this. And I think the single most important thing to know about our local market is inventory. The supply is very low and it's as low, quite honestly, as it's been in my entire career. And that's a long time. That low supply has choked the number of transactions. There's just not a lot for sale. And all the brokers tell me the same thing. Bob, we've got demand. We've got buyers, but we don't have the product to sell them. We don't have enough. Like I said, the supply right now, this is all the real estate in all of La Plata County. This includes commercial, light, industrial, which makes up a very small part of the market. But then it also includes residential, condos, townhomes, single family residential, and vacant land. And that number right there for the last three or four years is as low as it's been in my career in 37 years. And if you don't take home anything else from what I say tonight, that's the single most important thing impacting our market. Well, Bob, uh the clear magnitude of this can be uh, shared this way. Um, the Wells Group opened in 1985. Bob started collecting data in 1986. So we have a lot of old guys up here is what that means, but we have a lot of information. Uh, in 1985, the inventory was the same or below where it is in 2014 first quarter. That's a long time. Put it in perspective this way, La Plata County, when we opened the Wells Group, had 31,400 people living in the county. Today, the county is over 57,000 people in the county. So that's 82% more population. And we have the same inventory that we had in 1985. So you understand the magnitude of that, especially if you're shopping for property. And uh, this will build on itself as Bob goes through these slides. Bob? So along with that low supply, 
the number of transactions has fallen to a level that we saw back during the Great Recession and that we saw back when I first started in this business 40 years ago. And I don't know how that changes. We've got to increase that supply somehow. We're not alone. We're not alone in this environment at all. All the desirable places in the United States have this same similar problem. The residential units, the single family condos and townhomes, that supply is about a third in 2023 from what it was in 2019 continues to fall. And that's a seasonal supply. It goes up and down a little bit. But if you look at it on a December basis, it's down a lot. It's up 15% from 2022. But in my mind, so what? It's still really low. So that supply, that low supply chokes the demand. And without a lot more supply out there, the number of units sold has gone down. The volume has stayed pretty high. It's still over a billion dollars a year. And that's pretty strong for La Plata County. Why? What would you expect to see because of that? You expect to see the values have gone way up, which has kept that dollar sale volume high. Consequently, our median sale price has gone up. Supply goes down. Demand is strong. What happens to price? Econ 101, laws of supply and demand haven't really been repealed, at least not in my lifetime. You compare the median household income and the median home price in the Plata County, and that affordability has grown less and less over time. You have a growing divergence between the median home price, which has gone up faster than median income. So that makes it much harder for folks who actually work in Durango to afford a place to buy in Durango or in La Plata County. Speaking of Durango, move into the city of Durango. The city faces the same problem. Remember I said the most important thing is that first slide. Supply is really low. The city of Durango faces that same problem here. 27 units in December of 2023 that were available for sale. 20 single family homes. That's pretty low. That's a quarter. 25% of what it was back in 2019. Just, just not a lot for sale. And what happens is that demand, which is really an apparent demand, that demand is falling because there just isn't a lot for sale. So what do you expect to see? You see values going up. You see values, our median home price for single family homes in the city has gone up to almost 790, almost $800,000. Townhome sales, same thing, same problem. Aren't a lot of new townhome developments, so that supply is low and those prices are rising because that demand is there. Town of Bayfield, Town of Bayfield has a low supply. They've got a supply problem. We're going to hear from Nicole Killian as to how they might address that problem in the Town of Bayfield. And they have big plans going forward for some development over in Bayfield, as does the city of Durango. They're going to try, all try, to address this problem. All the government agencies, the decision makers realize that we've got a problem and they realize we got to put some units on the ground. Housing is very simply a numbers game. And you need the numbers to make it work. If the demand is there in a desirable place like La Plata County, like Durango, people want to come. If you build it, they're coming. Single family homes over in Bayfield, 470,000 bucks. That was 340,000 bucks but what, four years ago? That's a big increase, continues to rise. Supply and demand works. Bob, uh, just a few things to clarify. For those of you that are statisticians and watching the numbers, these numbers are a little different than Bob's. 
These were just pulled virtually two weeks ago. Bob's were kind of year-end numbers for median prices. But a few things to talk about magnitude. First of all, you, you've already heard the song and dance that we have, which is it's a supply and demand issue. Interest rates have reduced supply also because if somebody has a low mortgage rate, it's hard to let go of that. And that, with our in migration, just comp compromises the whole process. That being said, here's something to share with you that has another impact to us. Uh, Durango, this is median prices, 715, La Plata County, that's Bayfielding, Nashville, rural La Plata County, 600. This is all residential, excluding mobile homes and Bayfield in town, almost 500. Montezuma County's high because that has a lot of ranch land and acreage included in that. Uh, so Montezuma County's not a great uh, number, but look at Cortez, 290,500. And San Juan County, New Mexico, 250,001. So <clears throat> what does this mean? This means we are and have been seeing and will continue to see leakage leakage from the people that work in Durango and La Plata County and want to own a home, but have been priced out with these price ranges. Think about it. San Juan County, 250, Bayfield, 500, one half. Bay, San Juan County, New Mexico, 250, city of Durango, almost a third. So this is unfortunate because some of our workforce moves away from Durango. They work here every day, they leave. They spend some of their, uh, obviously, earnings on goods and services, possibly out of area, possibly in Montezuma County, possibly in San Juan County. Less so in Archuleta County because of the distance and the drive, and Archuleta County values are higher than Montezuma County, San Juan County. So we are gonna talk about this a little more later, but leakage is occurring, and this is something that we have to deal with, and we'll hear more from our guests tonight. Anecdotally, a simple story from my own perspective. It's been a long time since I've driven to Albuquerque. And this past Christmas, my wife and I had the opportunity, we flew out of Albuquerque down to Florida for a Christmas vacation. And we left midweek, about 6.15 in the morning. Got in our car to drive to Albuquerque. And when we left Durango, I was literally in shock. It was bumper to bumper cars coming in to Durango from Aztec and Farmington. It was bumper to bumper all the way until we got to Aztec and headed towards Bloomfield. I was in shock. I, I did not expect to see that. So I think John's right. There is the opportunity for a lot of folks, you know, they think, where else are we gonna live if we can't afford to live in Durango? And it's happening. Land is the same thing. Supply is down, supply is low, and what, that's half what it was in 2020, half what it was four years ago. We just aren't putting a lot more land, a lot more lots on the market. Where are you gonna build a house? And Consequently, those land sales have fallen. They're down by 50% from what they were back in 2021. Look at the vacant land sale activity by price. And you see the strongest activity here is oh, below three or $400,000, these red lines back in 2021 and then 2022 and 2023. But what's important to look at is, uh, that should say listings, that's my bust, that's an error. But these last lines in this chart here, that's what's for sale. Not a lot, that's disappointing. We're just not putting a lot of land out there at the right price. I'd like to look at we have in the past looked at uh, sales over a million dollars. Used to call that when I started a luxury market. John's gonna talk a little bit about how that may have changed. But those numbers remain pretty high here in the last three years. Say somewhere between 175 and 240 homes for sale. And the land 
number. Hasn't gone up a lot, hasn't changed a lot in the last 10 years. It's still right around where it is today. Thank you, Bob. So here's, here's uh, something we've changed in our, in our office, and this is a little explanation. Luxury residential real estate. Really, as an industry, uh, what is used in the industry is the top 10% of residential products sold. So that's this number, these numbers you see here, are the previous year's 12 months sales. For example, 2023, the sales were top 10% sales, a million four fifty, okay, and up. If you look at 2020, you see that substantial differential, which we obviously understand what happened post-pandemic and the great migration. So the value of using this going forward is, with all due respect, a million dollar home isn't what it was five years ago. When we go back, we asked Bob to start collecting million dollar plus residential sales 15 years ago. That was a lot, a lot of house 15 years ago, right? The value of the dollar was more as we go back, turn the clock back. But just to share with you, the value of this for us is to talk about how many sales are occurring and what is in the, in the industry considered luxury. What is Aspen? Anybody want to guess? Seven million, eight million plus. So that's why each market uses uh, or should use the top 10% of sales, just to put it in context. Thank you, Bob. Purgatory had another great year, but just like that very first slide, the most important thing to recognize is their inventory is down. So with their low inventory, their sales have dropped by about 50% since their peak back in 2021. And this includes sales a little bit more than just purgatory itself. I look at this area by this parcel number up here, which is an assessor's number, and that's how I look at my sales. It's easier for me to sort it that way. And that number, that parcel number, just for your own knowledge, starts at the North County line and comes down to about where Needle Store is a little bit further north. But the average vacant land sales transaction price, up 48%. Single family residential sale price up 13%. Those are reflective of low supply conditions. That's a problem up there as well. Glacier Club's been very strong here in the last three or four years. Uh, they didn't do quite as well earlier on, back in the early 2000s, but here recently they've done very well. And they really started to take off right during the pandemic. And those sale numbers have been strong ever since. And their volume, their sale volume, I mean, right there, that's, uh, what is that? That's almost 10% of the total market because it's such a strong luxury market. They've done very well. What are the basic forces that drive real estate demand? Number one is population. Population growth, when I started doing this 24 years ago, the state demographer had numbers for La Plata County's growth right here at this, on an annual basis, they had numbers at two, two and a half percent per year. And for many years, I just kept saying, that's not right, that's not happening. Unfortunately, people who go to issue bonds use that two and a half percent as their growth rate. They depend on those numbers. Well, it hasn't happened. It's less than one percent per year. This over in the town of Bayfield and in the town of Nashio, it's been a little stronger. Why? It's a little bit more affordable than in Durango. The Durango number is right about one percent. But I maintain that that population growth, if we had the units, that population growth would be stronger than it is right now. Where do the buyers come from? Well, since I've been here in 19, I moved here in 1981. Since I've been here, Texas has driven the bulk of the out of area buyers. Texas 
prior to the pandemic, it was more like six, seven, eight percent. And then during the pandemic, it jumped to 10, 11, 12, 13 percent. And it's been pretty strong ever since, followed by Arizona, New Mexico, and California, and the Front Range. Bob, when you look at uh, these four states and the Front Range, that accounts for about 28 percent of the sales on an annual basis. Clearly, the largest percentage of sales are regional, local, regional. But there's still a fair percentage that are not identified in this slide. And Bob, I think you maybe have a great slide to share with us. Where does everybody come from that purchase real estate in La Plata County? So, city of Durango, and the La Plata County Airport hired me to do a little analysis of where are our second homeowners from? Where do they live? And if you look at that map up there, looks a lot like what I just showed you here, doesn't it? You see a lot of density down here in Texas, that's Dallas, San Antonio and Austin, that's Houston, and then you see Albuquerque, you see Phoenix, you see the Front Range. This is Farmington. And so you see a lot of strength from those places that you would expect. But you also see a distribution across the country. You see San Francisco in that area. You see LA and San Diego. You see Chicago. You see the East Coast around DC and around New York. And then down in Florida, you see the coastline of Florida, both coastlines of Florida, well represented by buyers from those areas. So our breadth of buyers, where they're coming from, has really broadened. Uh, they're coming from more diverse areas across the country. 22% of the residential units in La Plata County are second homeowners. It's about 18%, 19% in the city of Durango. Hey, Bob, I did meet that one person from Mississippi on there. <laughs> did we see one person from Mississippi? Yeah, kind of. Labor force. Everyone knows that's a problem. Workforce housing is a big buzz. Got to talk about it. That labor force has stayed pretty stable for quite some time, five years at least. Why? Where are they going to live? So that labor force hasn't been going up. And as you all know, Local, comp local companies, local government agencies, college, people are all challenged not only to hold on to their labor, they're challenged to hire new labor. Why? They can't afford to live here. Our unemployment rate is lower than it is on a national basis. So we're challenged on the labor side, and that's, you know, that's pretty clear. If you go back to that very first slide, what the problem is. Mortgage interest rates are, could be considered part of the problem. I personally believe that we're going to have to get used to some higher rates here going forward. But right now, locally, what are they? Six and a half, seven percent, somewhere in that range. And I don't know if they'll go down a whole lot. Uh, there's predictions from the professionals in the world. I, I don't know what I'm talking about, so I don't know what's going to happen. But those interest rates here from these folks say somewhere between six and six and a half percent is what we're going to see in 2024. And back here last year when they did those predictions, they were talking somewhere between five and six and a half percent. So they were low the last year. Let's hope they are high this year. Let's hope it goes down a little bit more. But I, I'm not so sure we're going to see anything different. Yeah, Bob, back to that slide uh, in regards to the interest rates. Uh, fortunately, we, we were able to go to a real estate conference just two weeks ago where we, some of us were able to listen to a top real estate economist in the nation. Uh, she shared with us a long version of why the new normal is probably 6%. Part of that is in the pandemic time, the Fed, of course, brought the rates down. The government brought the mortgage rates down. They bought all those inexpensive or, or low-valued mortgage-backed securities. And we, in essence, had a non-normal mortgage market that some of you in this 
room, many of you probably enjoyed getting a high twos, threes, 4% interest rate on a fixed basis. Uh, what's going forward is the Fed has made a de determination they will not buy anymore and they're selling the rest of their portfolio. China bought a lot through the years. They have pulled back substantially and buying a very, very small percentage of mortgage backed, U.S. mortgage-backed securities. So the private sector investment group pool is back into the game. They expect a return. That's, that's kind of the 101 on it. Uh, just to give you an idea, though, let's talk some history. We've got a lot of history we've talked about tonight. 50-year history, mortgage rate. We could ask everybody to guess what that is. Some of you, uh, many of you weren't even here, of course. But the average for 50 years, 8.1%. Now, remember, the late 70s, early 80s, huge run-up, double, huge double-digit interest rates for mortgages. But that is part of that. That, that situation, 8.1%. Al Harper remembers that in, in Florida for very well, unfortunately. If we look at the 30-year average, it's 6.6%. So clearly, things do cycle. Uh, and the important thing that we as real estate professionals need to help the buyers in the marketplace understand is 6% is very much going to be the normal. We predict six to six and three quarters for 2024, hoping we'll get closer to that six number in uh, late 24 or 25. Thanks, Bob. Reversion to the mean is a real thing in the, the economic world. So back to the interest rates and the impact it's had. Cash purchases in La Plata County as a percentage of all the purchases has gone up to 41% here in 2023. That's up from 33% in 2022. That's a big number. That's pretty high. What's even more astounding is 57% of the residential sales above a million bucks in 2023, 57% of them were cash deals. What that tells me is there's probably not a lot of stress in our residential real estate market. A lot of cash out there buying real estate in La Plata County. If you go back in time, I've got this back to 1990. If you go back in time, these numbers averaged 20, 25%. So we're almost twice that today. That's indicative of a very strong market. And, and uh, with that, Bob, as you know, these 13 years averaging 31.3%, as we indicated the previous decade, more like in the 20, 25% range, 41% very likely with the mortgage rates going up they, the way they did in 22, 20 early, or, or actually in 23 primarily, late 22 and 23, drove some of that. But the magnitude of this uh, really surprises us, even though we're in this business. 41% of all sales, residential sales, cash. And the 57% probably doesn't surprise us as much. We have an uh, uh, under understanding that the higher the value, the home, the li more likelihood it's a cash purchase. Five, six, eight million dollars, probably a cash purchase. So the borrowing usually is happening, as this shows, under a million dollar purchase. Thanks, Bob. As most of you know, our good friend back here, Mr. Ballantyne, does a great job of publishing all the accolades that the city of Durango gets. It's all free advertising. We're not paying for it, and it happens all the time. We're ranked number one, Colorado tourist destination, second year in a row. Durango makes top 50 places to live. America's favorite Christmassy towns in 2023. Those kinds of accolades do nothing but market Durango. More and more people want to come and see what's going, in, going on here, seeing what we've got. Total visitors for the three major tourist attractions was pretty strong here uh, in 2023. Um, Mr. Harper set a record here in 2023, he was up uh, quite a bit, and the total for those threes was up about 5.5% in 2023. So we still have a strong tourism market. I happen to believe that tourism is still 
very important to our local economy. I happen to believe that the train is still very important to our local economy. Yes, Bob, uh, and with these three major attractions, it's very important to measure. That being said, the true visitation, best estimates, is about double this number of close to a million two. So closer to two and a half million, 2.4, two and a half million. So not everybody goes to all these attractions. Many visitors come here because we have such a high percentage of public lands, all that beautiful open space that we have. They enjoy the trails, they own biking, they enjoy the waterways. Uh, that, that is a big attraction when we meet people, uh, why they're enjoying Durango in addition to these attractions. But uh, let's also share with you that uh, the tourism organization did a study recently, a survey of their guests that came to the area. And the number one, number one reason, or I say reason, but the number one item on that list that they enjoyed by in visiting our Southwest Colorado area, downtown Durango. Downtown Durango is number one. The historic part of it, the mix of dining, uh, shopping, attractions, events is number one. So uh, we've got a good thing going there, right, Bob? Don't mess with it. It's, it's a winner, and it's been the greatest success story since I've been in business. So as you would expect, our lodging industry has been strong. This doesn't include vacation rentals, and there's really not an easy way for me to do that. But in La Plata County, I don't know, there's somewhere between 912 or 1,300 vacation rentals. I don't know what exactly that number might be. But if you divide those numbers by, say, 100 units for a typical hotel, that means there's somewhere between nine and 12 hotels out there in vacation rental units. And you know what? Those vacation rental units sometimes take two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people in one unit. So that has an impact on our lodging industry, but our still, our lodging industry has recovered very well back from that uh, pandemic low of 50% occupancy up to now, back to what I think is more normal, around 70%. And those rates are slowly rising, 167 bucks uh, average daily rate, or 120 bucks for our revenue. That's revenue per available room, which is, might be the most important thing to local hotel, any hotel owner. They wanna know how well they're doing. And so we're pretty strong, even though we've got that competition from the vacation rental market. Well, Bob, you know, as you mentioned, vacation rentals equal to potentially eight, nine, ten equivalent of hotel rooms. Uh, this is this is really strong when you look at uh, three years of growth of of occupancy and not only uh, daily rate but rev revenue per available room, and that is even though we have such a substantial inventory of vacation rentals, uh, mostly in the county. The city has more restrictions in regards to where uh, vacation rentals can be. Also, there's certain homeowners associations that don't allow them. That being said, we have a substantial percentage of vacation rentals and these hotel rooms. Brokers in this room get calls probably once every month, every other month from hotel developers because they see this 71% steady. And to them, that means there's, there's more opportunity for developing hotels, if they can find the site, if they can afford to build it. I don't put up a chart for this just because it's changed so much. Their taxing uh, percentages have changed so much in the past few years. But I did get this from the city manager here recently. So those lodgers tax collections were up about 6% in 2023 versus 2022. Retail sales tax collections were only up 2.9%. When you consider inflation, that's probably a flat number. Probably hasn't gone up a whole lot here in the past year. Airport passengers, Tony Vicari out there, the airport manager has done a great job uh, at the airport. And that airport passenger traffic continues to rise. It was a little low back in 2022, primarily because they were shut down for 10 days. He's about to complete a $7 million expansion program, which is gonna improve the passenger experience, 
but it's also going to improve the carrier experience. And those carriers, believe it or not, they care about their experience too. They want it to be good for them so that their people want to come and so that they want to fly out. It makes it easier on them. And that will work for everybody. The energy industry, I happen to believe is still important, still a big part of La Plata County. Our whole south uh, east quadrant of La Plata County has a lot of gas production, a lot of natural gas production. So those prices are critical. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% plus or minus of the folks that live in La Plata County depend on royalty income from their mineral interests that they have in La Plata County. That's a big proportion of the income in La Plata County. In addition, La Plata County's budget is dependent, heavily dependent upon the energy industry. 27% of the real estate tax, the real estate assessment in La Plata County is paid by these folks. That's a big deal. It was back in the early 2000s, somewhere around 60, 65%. It dropped here to two years ago, it was down to 16%. So it's back up. So I think that's important. The last thing I will tell you is why I think it's important is people in Farmington and Aztec, that's, that's an energy, those are energy communities. And those folks, if those prices are higher, those folks are coming up here and they're spending money in La Plata County. Believe me, that's what the credit card data shows. It shows there's a strong correlation with price of natural gas and visits from those uh, energy rich areas like uh, Farmington and even the Permian Basin further south. Last thing I'll talk about is construction. And most of you know that the cost of construction in the Plata County is really high. I don't know how that's going to change anytime soon. The number of general contractors in the Plata County is still 22% below the peak back prior to the Great Recession. So, no offense to those guys, there's not a lot of competition for the general contractors here locally. The same is true in the subcontractors, the specialty contractors. That remains almost 20% less than what it was back in 2007. Well, those folks face the same problem that everybody else faces. It's really hard for some of them to move here. It's really hard for them to live here. They can't afford it. I don't see that changing quickly. This number here for the subs has started to rise. So we're starting to see some relief on the subcontractor side. I don't see a change in the near term. number of residential units permitted. And this is all of La Plata County, so this includes the municipalities of City of Durango, Bayfield, Ignacio. And they're all working towards trying to increase units. They all understand the problem. But there's a lot of issues in the way. Policy issues, regulatory issues are in the way. Interest rates. Higher interest rates are in the way. Infrastructure costs are in the way. Vertical construction costs are in the way. It's challenging to bring new product. So this is probably the second most important slide that I put up here tonight. If you look historically, the total residential units that were built, this is the units permitted since 1990. The average, the average between 1990 and 2023, 400 units per year. Over the last 15 years, where'd I go? Come on back. Where'd I go? Uh oh, there we go. The average was 300 units. Over the last 15 years, that's a deficit of 100 units per year for 15 years. From my simple-minded perspective, that means we are running a deficit right now 
of 1,500 units, right? Had we built those 1,500 units, I'm not saying that values would have gone down. I'm just saying we would have had more places for people to live. Population growth probably would have been stronger, but we might not be in the same kind of workforce housing dilemma that we're in right now. And this is not indigenous. This is not a problem that's strictly a Durango or La Plata County problem. This is happening in all the desirable places across the United States. In rural La Plata County, they're faced with a problem. They don't have a lot of infrastructure out in the county to build new units. And Lynn Hyde's gonna talk a little bit about that. New County Planning Director, she's gonna tell us a little bit about how the county's gonna deal with that. City of Durango, single family building permits are down a little bit. We don't have a lot of single family lots in the city to build on. The next phase of Three Springs, where is it? Hasn't happened. We've got some lots over in Twin Buttes. A few. They gotta, they gotta put some more infrastructure in. It's gonna take them a couple years to do it. I don't see any relief in the near term here in the city of Durango from that perspective. Uh, I just don't know how that changes soon. This has changed. Multifamily permits has gone up here in the last two years. A lot of that is uh, motel, hotel unit conversion from motel, hotel units into residential units. That's a good thing from my perspective. That provides some more housing. We need it. We need more of that. And the city's trying to do some more. The city have seen some uh, articles in the paper recently about maybe some workforce housing being developed out on Florida Road, 140 units, right? Well, you just heard me say, we're 1,500 units in the hole. We need a lot of units. It's a numbers game, pure and simple. It impacts the apartment market. We're not building enough units. Let me show you how. Go back to 2017. See this number? 268 units were built, met, permitted in 2017. What were those? Largely, they were the Rocket Point units, 194 unit complex, and the uh, Confluence project out in Three Springs, 171 units. So let's say that's 350 to 400 units in two projects. That's a big addition to supply in those years. So they didn't finish those in 2017. They probably finished them in 2019. What happened? Look at the first quarter of 2020. That vacancy rate went up. Supply went up. Vacancy rate went up. Well, go back. We didn't build any units for three or four years, right? So what happened to that vacancy rate? It went back down, right? Well, here recently, we built more units. 22, 23, we built more units. What happened? That vacancy rate went back up. Back in uh, September of 2023, I can survey, when I do these apartment surveys, I can survey 18 or 1900 units. These managers will just tell me, okay, how many units you got vacant? And back in uh, September, they all told me the same thing. I said, Bob, that 2,500 to 3,000 month uh, market has really softened. There just aren't as many renters out there in that market. That seems like there was some exodus going on. Well, so we haven't built any units. Come January of this year, I go to survey them and I do it again. In February, I try to do it first quarter and third quarter. I don't try to do it every quarter. But they told me, Bob, that market's coming back. Most people are coming back, and we've all of a sudden got some demand in that 2,000 to 2,500 a month unit. Uh, anecdotally, I swim with another guy. He's got a nice home with a one bedroom unit and a two bedroom unit. And he gets somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 for the two and let's say 2,500 for the one bedroom. And he told me back in September, there was no one calling him. 
He was going 30, 60 days, no calls. Come January, Bob, I'm getting two or three calls a day. And then demand keeps coming, it keeps going, it doesn't go away. And then he told me today, he said, Bob, I got a call today from an individual who asked me, when does that lease come up? And I told, he told him, July. And that individual told him, I will do whatever it takes to rent that unit in July because there's nothing available. That's the state of affairs. Bob, you know, as, as you stay back on that slide, uh, the rental side, the important thing is this is a pretty good collection of data. Bob's got access to this many apartments. And there's people in this room today that are very curious about this slide and it's very important to them. But the important thing to all of us is there's also other rentals, right? Single family homes, some condos and towing homes that individuals buy as an investment. But it's really not dissimilar in regards to the trend of the vacancy factor and the demand. You know, the demand in the third quarter seemed to soften a little, or fourth quarter soften a little bit, and it right away picked up. And we're seeing, comparative to national or even state uh, vacancy factors, a very strong, strong market. What are any threats to this? Threats to any more supply are the cost of construction still and the borrowing cost to build a new apartment building today. Certainly you have to pencil that out at the higher range to make it work for the lender and the investors. Uh, also, back to my comment about leakage. As real estate to purchase is less expensive on adjoining counties, so is rental properties. Uh, much lower, probably half in Montezuma County and in San Juan County. So we may see some renters that transition with this high, low vacancy factor and high rent rates to these adjoining counties. Town of Bayfield, Nicole Killian's gonna speak to this, but they've got a lot of property, a lot of projects in the pipeline that will undoubtedly change these numbers down here in terms of single family building permits. Town of Bayfield is starting to move forward with their projects and you're gonna to start to see the building permit numbers rise in the town of Bayfield. Lastly, I'm gonna end with this. We don't talk a lot about the commercial real estate market in this presentation because there aren't a lot of players in, the low, in that market because it's such a tiny piece of the whole market. But I will tell you that that's why those last three years is why I don't believe our commercial market is overbuilt. If you look at retail property, with the exception of the Durango Mall, if you go to the strip centers, go down to Walmart, go downtown, look for vacancies. Call me up when you find them. Tell me where they are. Tell me how many of them there are. Town-wide, if I take them all out of the equation, we're probably running about a two, three, four percent retail vacancy. Believe it or not, the same is true in the office market. We haven't built any new offices. And it's really challenging to do that because the cost of construction is so high. And as that demand continues to chew into that supply, supply continues to go down. The office market is probably a little bit more supplied than the retail market, but there's not a lot. And Access Health just took 81,000 square feet. That was the old Mercury Payment Systems Building, WorldPay. Access just took that right out of the market, right? So there isn't a lot of new stuff, and it's really hard to build it. And I'm gonna end that right now. I'm gonna end my side of this program. And again, big hand for the Wells Group, and we got three ladies coming up to tell you about what they're going to do in the town of Bayfield, what they're going to do in the city of Durango, and what they're going to do in La Plata County. Hey, Bob, we're not over yet. You know, remember the three-hour limit we said? Three-hour limit? Kind of like the boat ride. Uh, but here's what we're going to do. Uh, we've got a little summary that we're going to share with you based on Bob's information, data that we collect with all our brokers at the Wells Group. Uh, and these are influences for this year. Uh, first one, HOA fees, Homeowners Association fees. 
policy, why, why would that be an impact? Well, inflation's happening in all categories. Homeowners associations, uh, let's just go and say that early resort condominiums, some of them were built in the late 60s, but 70s and 80s. In town Durango, the first condominium project was built in 1978. So those are getting long in the tooth. Some HOA boards tried to prepare for, for a sinking fund, surplus, building reserves, but it's hard. You know, you replace a roof on a large, let's say condominium project, it's very expensive today. You replace the asphalt on the parking lot, very expensive. We have seen exponential growth in homeowners fees, which impacts affordability. For people buying homes or condominiums and townhomes are a great entry level product have been. Now with insurance costs, which we'll get to in a moment, but homeowners fees going up, it's more and more difficult for that entry level buyer to obtain with the purchase price, with the mortgage interest rate, and the HOA fees going up. It's a big impact. Just to give you an idea, also, if we could go back and not have construction defect lawsuits, and I understand sometimes there's really construction defects, and I talk about condominium projects because this is a big issue in the state of Colorado. Basically, the uh, newest product of condominiums in Durango accepting Glacier Club, I'll mention in a minute, which is being built right now, is 2005-2006. Crossroads, 1201 Main, both downtown properties. Rivergate, 2005. Law Campanella, North Main, 2006. That's a long time since we've added new condominium product. Why is con typically condominium product less expensive? Density. A building with 10, 20, 30 units can be built less expensively than individual units or townhomes. Uh, so certainly that's an impact to our affordability and construction defect. I know the state keeps talking about helping the real estate industry with this, but it's difficult. Uh, one sidebar, Glacier Club decided to build condominiums. They're about a year and a half into the project. They have about another year to go, 30 units. And how did they do that? Uh, about a million dollar insurance policy for construction defect, a million dollars, 900 and some thousand dollars. So that, who pays that? The consumer pays that. You can't build necessarily an affordable condominium project and pay a substantial amount of insurance, so that's an impact. Interest rates, we already talked about that, won't belabor that. Lots of great information that we gathered that we just need to discuss the new normal, which is in the 6% range, hopefully the lower 6% range. Insurance. Um, I have friends here in the insurance industry, I told them I wasn't going to beat up on them because it's not their fault. But the insurance industry is behind the curve in staying up with inflation. Then we have disasters on the East Coast, the West Coast, you know, we got hurricanes and tornadoes, we have floods. In the West Coast we have fires, we have floods, we have earthquakes, we have obviously natural disasters, but the fact is insurance has gone up for everyone in this room. It's a situation where a real estate broker at the Wells Group used to discuss with their buying customer insurance 10 days before closing and get it the same day. Now, once you go under contract on a home, you have to start the insurance search because it may take multiple brokers, multiple different lines to find out if you can get covered. And I'm not just talking about substantially forested or steep locations. We're talking about every residential product. That feeds back into, again, that HOA fee because some of the HOAs carry those insurance policies. In-migration is going to continue to be a strong feeder. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, silver tsunami, as somebody t uh, termed it, which is baby boomers, which is, you know, older 50s to older 70s, were thought to uh, the, the, the industry thought they would really rush in the market and buy as they retire. It hasn't happened, but it's happening and it happens on a consistent basis. And still baby boomers are the number one buyers nationally of real estate every year. Yes, the other generations have come up substantially, but this is probably hold for a few years. What do they do? They buy a second home, vacation home, retirement home, and we're on the map for that. What else are we on the map for? Work from home. 
work remotely. Believe it or not, we've had some loss to that because some companies called people back, but we know many people that said to those companies, you know, we're gonna make a change and we're gonna stay here. And we still are servicing people moving to the area that can work from anywhere and they're choosing lifestyle to work here. Um, the low inventory, it just goes without saying, uh, you know, the, it, it, if, I would, if I had a home today and I was thinking of buying a different home that I had a low interest rate on, I should say, an uh, existing home, that's a lot of anxiety if you're going to borrow money. If you're a cash purchaser like the slide that we showed, it's less of an issue, right? But if you're borrowing money at 6.5% and you have a 3.5% mortgage, you're really considering if you need to make that change. That's going to keep the inventory low for a while. Uh, leakage, I've talked about that enough probably in a way, but leakage is going to become more substantial. In our office alone in this first quarter, we're not even through the first quarter, we've seen probably a half a dozen individuals choose to buy in one of these two counties I mentioned because they just can't afford a home in La Plata County. So those are just some thoughts to leave you with. The great part is we have some superb professionals that are gonna come up. Let's have you all three come up and, and take a seat up here. And Eva, you're gonna start, so I'm gonna have you come to the podium. And uh, they have some wonderful data for you. And uh, thank you for taking time to being here. Please enjoy the rest of the presentation. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Eva Henson, the City of Durango's Housing Innovation Division Manager. A little bit of background. The City of Durango uh, created the Innovation Division for Housing to focus efforts on below market inventory, right? So some of the things that we haven't really talked about with some of the slides uh, for workforce affordable and attainable housing. Uh, I started with the city in November of 2021. Uh, when the division started, I moved from Summit County, Colorado, a market more expensive than Durango, uh, but really fortunate with my experience and expertise to come and make impacts and change where we can here locally and really proud to be part of this community. Couple things, I won't spend a lot of time on data other than I'd like to focus a little bit about certificate of occupancies compared to what Bob had shown uh, you all. The last 10 years, uh, the city of Durango has seen on average about 125 units of certificate of occupancy. It's not gonna hit the mark like we talked about, right? For 2023, we hit 236. That's an 88% increase by 111 additional units, above 125 on the normal average. A big component of that was multifamily rental development. Another thing that we need in our pipeline, like Bob talked about, if we can increase the supply, prices might slightly come down a minute. When those vacancy rates hit, it's gonna affect those rental rates. Big part of that was the Gage Apartments over by Home Depot off of Escalante, um, as well as the motel conversion called River Roost Apartments, kind of right by Applebee's. A couple notable projects for 2023, the very large annexation for Durango Mesa, Mesa Verde Assisted Living and Memory Care uh, that'll be developed over in the South Fork area, which is just west of Three Springs over by the Subaru dealership. Gage Apartments I mentioned, Mercy Medical Office Building, our board and commission reconfiguration. We understand things are taking time. Time is money. So we are looking at efficiencies, ways to get projects through the pipeline more effectively to get these units built. River Roost Apartments I talked about, the downtown fire station, uh, the community development department and our engineering office are relocated in a new building. We are in the former Big Picture High School building. Um, and over by the 9R building, and we're excited there. Come visit us if you have any needs for those departments. Um, and then Anima City Park Overlook Townhome was another new development. When we talk about density, we need infill density. That's over by the North Main uh, City Market. Let's talk about below market inventory. That's the specialty that we are focused in right now and really proud to share some of these uh, data points with you all. So in 2023, we secured 150 units 
Why does that matter? One, we don't have it. We need it. Two, at scale. We really need to think about things at scale. So the residences in a Durango, sorry, residences at Durango is the best Western motel off of 160 uh, highway. And that'll create 120 units. So it will convert the 72 room motel and add two new buildings of 48 units behind there. It's a low income housing tax credit project. It is all rental, 60% AMI or less. Studios, one, two, and three bedrooms. That's never happened in most of our developments and is the largest scale project in the Southwest region. The first of its kind for the state. We got $4 million in grants at the city of Durango that have been deployed and expensed for this project, so we're really excited about that to make it happen. Um, and long-term for affordability for 40 years. Twin Buttes former Animus High School site will be a land donation that will create 30 affordable home ownership opportunities again, the first of its kind here in Durango. For new below market housing created, we focused on public-private partnerships to really leverage our opportunities at the local level with local funds, um, also being able to tap into possibly state and federal dollars. Anima City Park Overlook, we've secured uh, five deed-restricted home ownership units in phase one, 14 rent-restricted units at the Gage Apartments with an 80% AMI to one 20% AMI. Uh, Anima City Park Overlook was 125% AMI deed restricted. And the new Leasing for Locals program was a creative way for us to address our needs uh, for workforce housing with a voucher rental subsidy program. We secured 30 units, one, two, and three bedroom units again. So not just focusing on those small studios and ones, but creatively and innovatively approaching public-private partnerships to create new inventory. That spectrum that I just talked about is a continuum. We just hit 60% to 125%. We need that pipeline, right? So people can navigate in between different needs, different size units, and different price points. For below market housing inventory, we've inc increased it by 51 units, like I talked about, a 9% increase in one year. A little bit about current residential projects in review. We are tracking this. It's important, right? We need the delta. We need to start to have some knowledge and history of where we're going, how we're doing it, what's working, what isn't working. So on the city's housing webpage, this is updated every six months because projects are not moving through the pipeline as quick as we would like them to. And so you can always look there for data. Right now, the breakdown is about 1,458 units to be built in the pipeline. What's that breakdown? 15% of it will be below market, 16% will be ownership opportunities, and 69% will be rental. A really key component, 225 units of that is below market housing. That is more than the last 10 years in this community that is so much needed for our local workforce. Again, wanted to focus a little bit on quarter one, since we had limited time to share a lot of our information with you all. Uh, 225 units, we're again talking about the residences at Durango. It's a mix of those unit types. It is currently under construction, anticipated to be completed in 2025. We have housing projects pages for each of these projects on the housing website as well, so you can understand when's the timeline, when are they gonna be built, how can I find out more information about those? Please go to the DurangoCo.gov website. Twin Buttes former, former Animus High School site, again, 70 to 120 for ownership opportunity through a public-private partnership, land donation. Again, first of its kind, we're working with Elevation Community Land Trust. Fading West is a modular construction uh, company. They will be financeable, they're on foundations. Um, and again, just a creative approach to how we address the cost of construction. Durango Crossings, 149 units, of which 75 units will be deed restricted. 50% of those will be 70 to 120, and 50% will be for sale ownership, so not rental only, but a mix. Mixed income development is where we're focusing our efforts right now, again, to leverage the pipeline of things getting built in Durango. 
Couple things for non-residential projects for 2024 and quarter one. Affinity Apartments will be in Three Springs, 162 units under review. REI is coming to Durango, happy about that or not. Uh, 22,000 square feet uh, development, which will be out by Bodo area. McDonald's is coming into the South Fork area near, th near Three Springs. And the Mesa Verde Assisted Living and Memory Care has also received a building permit for 124 units. A look ahead, right? We want to be positive. I'm trying to uplift you all with some information <laughs> after a lot of the sort of, I will say, a little bit of doom and gloom. I know we can't build our way out of this, but we're tackling it with a multi-prong approach. There isn't a siloed effort here to address housing, and we're really focused on trying to achieve those results in a variety of ways. Uh, so creating more diverse housing opportunities and increased affordability to bridge the disparity between income, home, and rental prices. Again, exploring and continuing to look for revenue streams. Guys, it's not getting any easier and it's not getting any cheaper. Um, advancing our housing accelerator program. Again, making these projects that have set aside units for below market and affordable attainability purposes. Make those a priority to get those through the pipeline quicker. We are looking again at public-private partnerships. We talked a little bit, I think Bob did, about Three Springs and La Posta and what's going on with those or not. They are sort of moving forward slowly. We are looking at our development review software. We want to make it more efficient. We want to get things faster. And we also want to make sure that our customers are served well and also with online payments. So that'll be a big plus for our department. We're really excited about that this year. We continue to engage with our community on a variety of efforts, so continue to look for that at the City of Durango's website. We're continuing to work with our community partners, such as Housing Solutions for the Southwest, Homes Fund, uh, Economic Development Alliance, as well as the Urban Renewal Authority approach for workforce and affordable housing efforts. And land use. We talked a lot about policy and regulatory tools. We have to improve those, and we continue to do so we are taking the fair share inclusionary zoning program through with updates to the Community Development Commission uh, March 25th that will go to City Council in May. Muchly needed to modernize that program. Parking code, lighting code, mushrooms it looks like, <laughs> and temporary <laughs> use permits to name a few. We're also looking at our building permit fee with the possibility of some increases for that to get up and catch up uh, with valuation uh, and costs. But we're also looking at a fee, affordability, waiver, and rebate program to offset any projects with those set-aside units to not be a barrier for cost. And with that, I'll leave it to Nicole. Thank you all. Thank you, Eva. Um, thanks for having me tonight. And let's talk about Bayfield. Um, so what's going on in Bayfield? Um, 23 was a big year for us. Um, Bayfield, we're trying to bring some of our long-range plans and codes um, up to par where they should be. Um, it's been a while since Bayfield had a lot of updates to their plans and codes. Um, we also have been writing a lot of grant um, requests for funding, and we've received a lot. In the two years I've been there, we've received almost $6 million in grant funding for different projects in our community. So, so that's huge. One of the big ones is um, the town bought Simmon Heights 30 units, the existing platted lots in town Bayfield. And we are currently looking for a developer to come in. Um, we have 2.7 million to give to that project. Um, and so that's an exciting project. And you know, we want to see deed restricted units for all 30 of those. Um, we're doing dark sky certification with the state of Colorado. We were one of two communities selected this year for, um, from the Sonoran Institute to do a water and land use matrix process, really tying our future water use to our land uses and how we develop to make sure that we are sustainable with our water as we move forward, as well as offering some incentives to our community of how to conserve water moving forward as well. Um, we adopted the 2018 building codes. We adopted a new mission, vision, and values for the town. We um, approved our new Joe Stevenson Park Master Plan, which is our main um, park in the community. Um, so we have some big plans for that park. And then also we um, updated our 20, we updated our 18 comprehensive plan, um, and it's now the 2023 comprehensive plan, really concentrating on sustainability um, and housing um, in our community. 
Um, in terms of project statistics, again, in the last two years, um, I've been with Bayfield for two years now, we've annexed 229 acres of land. Um, that bringing in hopefully 360,000 square feet of commercial in the future, um, 408 single family units, 70 attached units, 20 duplex units, 201 multifamily. Um, actually, it should have been 15 manufactured units. Those are our tiny home village. It's 15 units. And then we also just annexed a property that wants to do an RV park in town. So maybe that's our thing. We don't have a hotel, so maybe we'll see an RV park. Um, and they're looking at 100 sites for campers, tents, as well as cabins. Um, in terms of non-residential projects, in 23 we didn't have too much going on, but in 2024 we've got a lot going on now for non-residential. We have a new Christian school that's looking at locating in Bayfield. Um, our fire district is looking at building a new fire station as well as bringing a medical clinic, which we don't have, and that's a huge need for our community. Um, we have a new restaurant coming into town, so more options for our residents, and also tractor supply is in review um, in the town of Bayfield. In terms of transportation projects, we have two main transportation projects along Highway 160. The one on your right side is our new signal that we've been working towards. Um, we just applied for some congressionally directed spending last year, and we were told on Saturday that we got 1.57 million coming to us for that signal, so that's pretty awesome. And then we're also looking at um, a middle area um, between our two signals for another maybe p pedestrian crossing. Um, so that's in the study right now. And both of those, again, grant funded. We are also redoing all our sidewalks on Mill Street, which is our downtown district. Um, we've completed the West Mill Street sidewalk project. We are currently working on the East Mill Street and then hopefully working our way towards the middle. Um, both these projects, we've received um, the downtown Main Street grants for those. Um, in terms of residential projects, Clover 7, this was approved in 2020, and this one, we are running out of inventory. This one's almost fully built out, um, 54 single-family units um, in the east side of town, the southeast side. Um, Mustang Crossing, this one's currently under construction, a total of 81 units, but right now they're building 19, um, and so we'll be seeing hopefully building permits in the next couple weeks on this project um, for those 19 units. Orchard's a little tiny infill, one acre uh, piece of land. It is approved for 14 units, so 14 um, units per acre is what that's come out to. Nine single family, I'm sorry, 13 units now. They, they've reduced theirs. Nine single family and then four townhome units on that larger lot. They have two COs and two that are close to COs and they're pulling more permits on this project as well. Marlin um, Tiny Home Village is our new tiny home village, um, 15 units. Um, we have six units located on that right now. They were looking at maybe a five-year build-out. My guess is it's going to be a two-year build-out um, in terms of those units coming in. <laughs> Bayfield East is our largest. 153 acres was annexed last year. And this is um, a mix of a bunch of different types of uses, um, including our larger commercial areas that we annex into the town. This project really cannot get started until we get that second signal. Um, into the community, and so that signal is pretty important. And the town's taking the lead on the signal, trying to make, um, trying to help the developers not have to cover that cost of that signal. So that's why we're looking at grant funding for, for that project. Cinnamon Heights. This is the project the town purchased. So right now, you can go to Rocky Mountain Bidnet if you're interested. Um, we're looking for a developer to do 30 townhome units. The town's already paid for all the engineering, all the architecture, geotechnical. Um, we got 2.7 million to help with the infrastructure, and so we're hoping that we can find a partner to um, build 30 deed restricted units. And what I like to tell people in Bayfield is, you know, people in Durango, people that live out of the area will commute to Durango. I commuted for almost 16 years to Durango for work, but people are not going to commute to Bayfield. Um, we, you know, as our teachers and our firefighters are moving to Aztec and Farmington, they're going to get jobs down there. They're not going to commute all the way to Bayfield for work. So we really do need to house our workforce in our community. And so Cinnamon Heights is one way that we can do that. And so with deed restricted, we can actually tie those deed restrictions to certain um, requirements as it like somebody who lives in the county. Um, and we can tie them to um, different um, 
what we call average um, area median income. So we are looking at 80 to 120 percent area median income, AMI. Um, so we can have these restrictions in place. We're looking at maybe a 3 percent um, increase every year for your um, property versus what a market rate increase would be for your property. Um, so there's different things that we can tie to that deed restriction to try and hope to capture our local workforce into those units. Um, but also open to, you know, retirees that maybe have lived in the area for a long time too and want to downsize their unit so that that opens it up to a family that can to grow into a bigger home. So the deed restricted units, it's just a piece. Um, in Bayfield, we're just looking at all of the inventory that we can bring in and there's just a, a bunch of different things that we need. We need ha um, single family, we need market rate single family, we need deed restricted, we need apartments, we need tiny homes, um, so town homes, all of that's important. And so right now we're just looking at what kind of inventory can we bring in, um, but deed restricted is one um, part of that. And so that also leads to Pine River Commons. This is actually a private developer who's doing this project, and it's, he's looking at 66 single-family attached units, and he is also wanting to do deed restriction. And in Bayfield, we don't have a fair share requirement for deed restriction, so he just wants to do it because he really wants to provide that type of housing for our community. And so we've done everything we can to try and help find grant funding for this project, and we just found out yesterday that they received a grant, um, so it's $50,000 per unit for the first 24 units. So it comes out to 1.2 million. So another 1.2 million coming into our community and getting some deed restricted housing for this project as well. Um, Ironton, this is the one that's the RV park. Um, they are looking at 20 duplex lots, possibly rentals um, at the beginning, um, possibly for sale. They're not sure yet on those but looking at 100 RV sites um, and cabins in our community within walking distance to our downtown and our um, Joe Stevenson uh, Master Park. And then Clover Meadows Phase 8, they're just very at the very beginning of this process. Um, multifamily, average 20 units per acre, um, already zoned infill development in the town, and so um, we'd like to see um, some, some higher density in that location. So 2024 goals, um, we have a lot of annexations that we want to do that are, um, we have what we call enclaves, they're county properties that are in the middle surrounded by town limits. So trying to clean up our um, town limits and um, getting our highway projects um, at least far enough down the road where we're um, shovel ready so we can get some more funding for those. Um, Cinnamon Heights RFQ is out, so again, if you know anybody who does deed restricted um, development, send them to the Rocky Mountain bid net for that. It, and um, it April 1st is the deadline for that proposal. Um, continuing to do the construction on our downtown sidewalks. Um, the town of Bayfield, we also adopted a stormwater fund last year. This is similar to what you would see for a water and sewer fund in a community, um, but this would be paying for stormwater projects. And, and we had a pretty major event in 2022, a 500 year flood event, and we had a lot of flooding. And so that really brought this up to a high priority for our community. And um, so we're fi finishing up a feasibility study that'll determine what each property owner would be paying towards this fund. And as part of that, we're also looking at taking over all of our HOA owned stormwater facilities to make sure that the town is able to maintain those because um, HOAs don't always keep those um, maintained as um, needed to work appropriately and so the town's looking at taking on all stormwater facilities and using this fund to help cover that program. Um, and then like I said, water, we're tying water to land use and land use to water. Um, we are also looking at a lodger's tax. We're starting to see a lot more interest in vacation rentals. We did, um, one of the things I did when I first started was put a cap on those in our community as well. Um, but we're seeing a lot of interest in that and so looking at a lodger's fund as well as the RV park coming into town. We do not have a lodger's tax right now. And then just looking for grant funding. Um, we got all these other projects that we want to do and we're such a small town, we don't have a lot of sales tax revenue that comes in and so grant funding is really how we get these projects done and completed. And um, just final goals are um, as we adopted our comprehensive plan last year, we have a lot of um, code amendments that we need to make and so looking at housing um, code amendments, food trucks, oil and gas, um, but the, the one that we're going to be starting next is our agriculture zone. We have a lot of surrounding ag land um, around Bayfield and a lot of the property owners have 
communicate with us that they would be interested in annexing into the town and being able to do ag more agribusiness out of their, um, their properties, whether that's just farm stands that people can go in um, and purchase directly from the farmer or whether it's events that they want to be able to host on their properties. And so we are going to be looking at, as part of our comprehensive plan, we had a section there about agriculture zones. And so we're going to be looking at that and trying to create an agriculture zone in our community so that we can annex some of these um, adjacent properties and help them to continue that agribusiness that they want to want to do in the area. And with that, I'm just super excited that we have a community development director for La Plata County. So just wanted to turn it over to Lynn. I just want to say that in my time, I have really enjoyed and I'm thrilled to be a part of the La Plata County team. It's a fantastic team to work for and I'm one of those Zoom workers that decided to stay instead of working remotely for the city of Bozeman, which I was doing, um, decided to stay here instead of relocating to Bozeman for the job. So I'm in your, I'm in your stats. That's me. All right, so community development department overview. I thought I'd share a little bit about what we are right now currently sitting in our office, what is happening. So the community development department in La Plata County does include the planning and building as well as code enforcement for this group tonight. I think the more relevant after you all got to see the building permits is to focus on the active land use permits or planning applications. So we currently have 160 active permits that are being reviewed um, today. That's, that's a tremendous amount of work for our team who's doing an excellent job getting these through. As of those 38 are major land use permits or major subdivisions, those are going to be the ones that take longer and, and require a lot more of staff time. 34 minor plat and plans, and then the simpler planning projects, boundary adjustments, lot consolidations, ADUs. What that looks like, what those projects actually are when you break down is um, for commercial or non-residential projects. Uh, a lot of storage units, we see a lot of interest in those. Three are currently being reviewed, but um, pretty regularly we get inquiries about those. When you're looking at the county, we see the desire for folks to move their businesses, um, more construction facility type businesses, storage yards. So we look at a lot of those. We do have some retail. We have an ag permit process in our code that um, attempts to make the attempts to recognize that agriculture is a, a important use for our county and to recognize that we have a unique process for ag permits if you qualify for that. Uh, recreational vehicle parks we have a lot of demand for that as well so um, we could chat when you dig into those we've spent a lot of time looking at those and what that means and what the, that means to the communities and then existing business expansions. Um, I think we're fortunate to see some businesses doing really well in the county who are wanting to expand. And when we look at goals, that's something I'll mention again is how we can assist those existing businesses to expand and, and, and celebrate the successes that they're having. For residential projects, the, what we are seeing right now, again, if, this is if every project that is under review today were to materialize into lots and units, which we all know is not necessarily the case. Um, people change their projects, factors influence their projects outside of the county or the applicant's control. But what we're looking at today, there are 14 ADUs that are being permitted. We have 293 new lots that are currently being contemplated. We anticipate the majority of these will end up being detached single family household, although um, we're not certain, but it does appear that that's what they're mostly being contemplated for. And then what I actually thought was interesting as I was pulling these numbers together is we do have 419 new residential units, and that's for units other than detached single family household. I think often when you think of uh, these types of units and housing typology, um, you would expect to see those more in the the urban area, but where we see a lot of the development has to do with the infrastructure, as Bob mentioned. So where we're seeing this, the more dense infill or some of these higher numbers is certainly when it's around uh, the Durango city limits. DMR, Durango Mountain Resort Purgatory, we see that as well as Glacier. So a lot of those, I would say, um, 
what I don't have, what I wish I had for you tonight is a, more a heat map of where we're actually seeing those permits, but I can share it. It follows the infrastructure. That's where we'll see that infill. And the county is looking at a different set of infrastructure than incorporated areas. So where we're seeing it primarily, the more dense applications is near the Durango city limits, Purgatory and um, Glacier Club. Edgemont is no longer the big player that you'll see in here as most of that is built out. They are um, kind of wrapping up the final stages of their development. Um, so moving forward, you know, as I mentioned, I've been there seven months and when I came in, there was a list of probably 60 code amendments that we are hoping to move forward since the, the kind of major overhaul of the code in 2020. And due to the high level of projects that have been coming in, the staff has had to put some of those um, on a side burner, we'll call it, and they haven't been moving forward as quickly as we would like to see. So that's one of the efforts that we're making now that we are at a um, staffing capacity where we can free up some staff space for long range code amendments, um, district plan updates, those are something else that we are hoping to get back into a regular cadence of. And then of course those, those code amendments should mirror and follow closely behind the district plan updates so the, the code's accurately reflecting what the public and planning commission and, and Board of County Commissioners has indicated they'd like to see. So really getting the, those moving forward again is, is a goal. Um, those, the top two on this one, improved customer service and process improvements, I think those two are ones that should be most likely on everyone's slide every time. That's, that's something that we'll always continue to work on. We know we have room to grow and improve, and I think that we will probably, hopefully we'll say that every time, is how can we get better at our customer service and how can we look at where the process can be refined and improved so that it best serves both applicants as well as our existing residents. The business expansion efforts, that's something that I mentioned earlier. One of the things that we want to do is make sure we're rewarding and working with our local businesses in the county and um, creating a great relationship with them so when they come in and do want to expand, we're in a place where we can assist them to meet their, their goals. And we have some ideas of what that might look like, so we want to continue that conversation. The county as a whole, we want to look at our, our code and see where we can improve options for affordability, missing mental workforce housing, and that's going to be a lot of different tools and happy to, to answer questions or dig into those more, but we understand there's a lot of tools that we need to implement and there's no one answer to all of the discussions and issues that you all are talking about tonight, and we certainly want to start to, to implement some of those tools in our code. Continue supporting the Regional Housing Alliance, which has been a great partnership. And Kevin Hall, who is here perhaps still tonight, has been the main liaison with the county for the Regional Housing Alliance, and that's something that we'll continue putting our efforts towards. Um, I mentioned the long-range planning efforts. Another thing that we've been looking at is multimodal systems for the county and where we can set the county up for success, whether it is working with developers that come in and what multimodal um, my means, I'll, I guess I should elaborate on that, is where are there opportunities where we can have something other than a road, whether that is a, tra um, a transportation path, a recreation path, opportunities to partner with transit. We want to make sure that we are thinking forward when these properties turn over and develop and will likely not have another opportunity for you know, 50 to 100 years, depending on how long that might be, making sure that we are correctly capturing needs for these networks to exist in, in the future for the residents and the community. So that is what I had for you tonight, and that concludes my presentation. I look forward to, to fielding any questions that you all may have. Uh, but to conclude, uh, let's give another hand to our great guest speakers. And uh, bear with me for just a couple things, but again, we mentioned our sponsors at the beginning. We'd like to thank them again. Alpine Bank, American Ag Credit, Animus Mountain Mortgage, Bank Central, Bank of Colorado, Bank of the San Juans, Mountain to Desert Mortgage, the Norm Phillips team, Sinberg Capital Lending, and TVK Bank. Also, I'd like to thank Bryce. Thanks for, thanks for your sponsors. Bryce from Fort Lewis kept us all working over here. We appreciate that. 
But uh, just to let you know, we have 40 full-time brokers uh, that are, most are here tonight. You can reach them anytime at our office. They can have more discussions with you. If they don't have the answer, they'll find it out for you. So you can ask any of our brokers and staff for that. So we appreciate the brokers and staff for helping put this on. And uh, they are available for questions. As I mentioned before, the QR code, you can get the slide back and the video presentation will be about a week, five days to a week away, and that will be live. Thank you all for your attendance. Have a wonderful evening.